Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, and uh, this is a continuation of the lecture on formants, and we are continuing with the course NPTEL MOOC course Phonetics and Phonology A Broad Overview. So, we have learned that the glottal source has sinusoidal uh, components, and we saw that these sinusoidal components then go through the filter, and as a result, we have the output spectrum. And this is the laryngeal source and with the sinusoidal components which uh, undergoes through the vocal tract filtering which has the vocal tract with its own resonances filter uh, the sinusoidal components as a result we have the output spectrum which has properties of both the filter and the source. So far that is what we have uh, we saw when we were uh, looking at source filter theory and the components decrease in amplitude over um, by 12 decibels per octave and the shape of the vocal tract determines the resonant frequencies which you already know and the vocal tract act as a filter of the sinusoidal components emanating from the source. And we also know that the resonant frequencies of vowels are referred to as formants and it is F1, F2, F3 and so on and where F1 and F2 are generally considered the most important for the analysis or the quantification or finding out the, the most relevant frequencies uh, form and frequencies of vowels. The formants of schwa can be approximated by the resonances of a tube closed at one end and open at the other. So, the schwa is a sort of uh, is different, it is schwa is different, schwa is special because it can tell you about the length of the vocal tract. So, the formants of the schwa can be approximated by the resonances of a tube closed at one end and open at the other and uh, which is not relevant for all the other vowels. So, we see a formula here which says Fn is equal to 2 n minus 1 multiplied by c divided by 4 l where l is the length of the supraglottal cavity. So, uh, suppose that the length of the vocal tract is 17.5 centimeter and we have to recall that the sp speed of sound in air is about 350. Suppose we take into account these two values and put the values, the relevant values uh, here. So, this value for C and this value for L and then as a result what are the frequencies that we will get. So, if you use these values, you will find that the first formant will be 500 hertz, the second formant will be 1500 hertz and the third formant will be 2500 hertz and we are talking about the schwa. So, this is uh, good to remember that the idealized values for the frequencies of a schwa will be at the most uh, neutral state of the vocal tract will be 500, 1500 and 2500 hertz. And uh, these are, as I have been saying, that the, the schwa has special properties and therefore, the shape of the vocal tract during the steady state of the schwa is approximately a uniform tube, which cannot be said for the other vowels. That is a single cross-sectional area that characterizes tube along with its entire length. So, it is a single area and we will see that it cannot be said for the other vowels and we need more um, cross-sectional area that we will talk about when we talk about the other vowels. So, this allows for a closed form calculation of formants of the formants of the schwa and as a result uh, these are the predicted values of a schwa that is 500, 1500 and 2500 hertz. 
So, as we have been saying, formants of a Schwa are approximated by the resonances of a tube closed at one end. And for a vocal tract of 17.5 centimeter, we have these values for the Schwa again. So, uh, where we use the speed of sound here and the length of the vocal tract for the values, for value of C, we use the value speed of sound, for L, we use the value for the length of the vocal tract. And so, this is our formula where 2 n minus 1 is multiplied by C and just divided by 4 L. And this formula is actually used for the calculation of formants where the tube is closed at one end as we will see. But then the model of formant calculation that we are talking about that is a tube model uh, assumes more than one tube for most of the vowels. So, another thing that we have to remember when we are talking about formants is that the Whereas, we saw that this is the formula which is used for the calculation of, of the schwa that is 2 n minus 1 multiplied by c divided by 4 l and that is the formula which is used for a tube closed at one end. But when we are talking about resonant frequencies of a fixed string that is both ends are closed. So, then this is the formula that we use at f n is equal to n v by 2 l and where v is the speed of the transverse waves on the string and n is an integer multiple which is which can be 1, 2 or 3. And uh, so, this is the difference between a tube closed at one end and a tube which is closed on both ends like a fixed string. So, as we have just mentioned a tube closed at both ends has the same resonant frequencies as a string fixed at both ends. And a tube closed at one end and open at the other has a different set of resonant frequencies. So, f n equal to 2 n minus 1 multiplied by c divided for divided by 4 l where n is equal to 1 to 3 etcetera. This was what was used for the calculation of the formants of the schwa as you can see and again that is used for all the vowels where a tube is closed at one end. So, the a resonant frequencies of vowels are f1, f2, f3, etc. And the formants of the schwa can be approximated by the resonances of a tube closed at one end and open at another, where L is the length of the supraglottal cavity. And that is uh, repeating what we saw a while ago that if we assume that this is the uh, speed of sound in air and this is the length of the vocal tract, then these are the values that we get for the schwa. So, the general acoustic theory of uh, vowels is more complex than that. We assume multiple tubes, Helmholtz resonators and perturbation theory etcetera. So, and apart from that measuring vowel formants with linear predictive coding. So, uh, multiple tubes is what Helmholtz resonator is something which we will talk about now and measuring vowel formants with linear predictive coding is not a part of this lecture. So, uh, the thing to remember is that the two models that we will talk about now uh, predicts the kind of formants that you will find in different vowels and uh, measuring uh, vowel formants with linear predictive coding is actually how uh, formants are measured. So, longer and wider tubes have lower resonant frequencies and that is why the integer multiples 1, 2 and 3 are used for the different formants. And the resonances of multiple coupled tubes are quasi independent. So, and the first formant is the lowest resonance of the entire system and the second lowest resonance of the system and so on. So, this is a general property that is assumed that the lowest f1 is the lowest resonance of the entire system. Now, what does that mean? We will see that uh, gradually uh, in this lecture. So, non schwa vowels involve uh, one or more constrictions with length shorter than the vocal tract length, and the shape of the vocal tract is not well described by a single tube of fixed area. But the shape can be approximated by two or more coupled tubes with different areas. So, as we just mentioned uh, that non schwa vowels involve more constriction. So, remember the cross sectional area that we talked about the schwa was uniform. It is the most neutral 
um, state of the vocal tract. But the things could be more complex for other vowels. So, and that is why they involve one or more constrictions with length short, shorter than the vocal tract length. And the shape of the vocal tract is not well described by a single tube of fixed area. So, as, uh, remember that to calculate the formants of the schwa, we just took into account the length of the vocal tract. What we are going to show now is that we cannot do that for all the vowels because as we had just mentioned for the production of the schwa, we have the most neutral state of the vocal tract and the entire vocal tract, the length of the entire vocal tract can be taken into consideration for the calculation of the formants. However, it is not so for the other vowels and they involve more constrictions with lengths which are different and mostly shorter than the vocal tract length and that is why they are different from the schwa. And the shape of the vocal tract is not well described by a single tube of fixed area. But the shape can be approximated by two or more coupled tubes with different areas. And let us talk about other vowels now. And if we compare suppose the formants of a ah with the formants of uh, the schwa. So, f1, f2 for a schwa would be 500 and 1500 hertz. Compare this to the formant frequencies of the uh, vowel R. So, F1 is higher for R because it is the first resonance of a shorter tube and which is the front cavity. So, recall when we studied articulatory phonetics that these are different cavities which are involved in the production of the different vowels and F2 is lower for R because it is the first resonance of the lower than the schwa. So, while F2 for A is 1000, F2 for the schwa A is 1500. And again, F1 is higher and F2 is lower. F1 is higher because it is the first resonance of a shorter, much shorter tube than the vocal tract. And F2 is lower for R because it is the first resonance of a shorter tube of the back cavity and not the second resonance of a longer tube. Now, these values are there for the schwa because these are the result of the same tube because this is the first resonance and second resonance of a long tube 500 and 1500. But suppose we take into consideration a vowel like R, the form and frequencies of this vowel is going to be different because this is the resonance of a shorter tube and first resonance of a shorter tube and first resonance of a shorter tube of the back cavity and this is the front cavity. So, the two cavities are involved in the production of the vowel R unlike the schwa. So, this is how a tube model predicts form and frequencies of different vowels based on the different tubes which are involved in the production of the vowels and their, and their resonant frequencies. So, suppose uh, the high front unrounded E and here we can actually talk about three tubes. The resonant properties of the vowel E can be approximated with three tubes. So, this is a visualization of uh, E and we can see that uh, this is a British English production of E. So, this is where this has been taken from. So, if it is an E vowel, then the different cavities which are used, the front cavity, the back cavity and also the glottal. So, we have the pharyngeal area, we have the oral cavity and lips and all these different parts of the production of the E will be relevant, the, their resonant frequencies will be relevant in the approximation of the formants for this vowel. So, uh, importantly now we come to an important part of this which is called the uh, Helmholtz resonator. So, uh, there is a middle tube in the production of E which is representing the constriction along the palate and the back tube form a subsystem called the Helmholtz resonator where this formula is used for the calculation of that resonant frequencies. So, recall that we are talking about three tubes here and the length 
of the three tubes will be relevant in the calculation of the uh, resonant frequency of the Helmholtz resonator. Now, what is a Helmholtz resonator? So, it is actually not something which was originally meant for the description of formants. So, uh, this is something attributed to Helmholtz and uh, Helmholtz resonator or Helmholtz oscillator is a container of gas with an open hole like this and the volume of air in and near the hole vibrates because of movement of the air inside. And uh, it is said that the Helmholtz resonator augments which is increases the amplitude of the vibratory motion of air enclosed of enclosed air in the chamber this one it increases here by taking energy from sound waves passing in the surrounding air. So, basically there is a there is a springiness in the air trapped in this resonator. So, this is what a uh, Helmholtz resonator actually looks like and the middle tube of the production of the vowel E is supposed to approximate a Helmholtz resonator and this technically this is what a Helmholtz resonator is. So, as you can imagine there the additional tube that appears in the vowel E is a bit more complex than the formula that we had seen for the uh, calculation of the other two vowels schwa and a. Uh. So, f 1 is lower for E by the relationship between Helmholtz resonances and tube resonances and that is why always we will find that the f 1 for the vowel E is always much lower. So, um, I beg your pardon there is a mistake here. So, the f 1 and f 2. So, f 1 for E is 300 hertz and F1 for Schwa, as we already know, is 500 hertz. So, this is E, this is Schwa, and uh, F2 for uh, E, the vowel E is much higher and at 1900 and uh, it is lower for the vowel Schwa at 1500. And so, these two vowels we have E has these two form and frequencies and schwa has 500 and 1500. So, F 1 is lower as we can see this one is only 500 for a uh, and only 300 for E. So, this is lower E has lower F 1, but E has much higher F 2 with 1900 because it is the first resonance of a shorter tube the back cavity and not the second resonance of a longer tube. So, like the supraglottal uh, cavity of the schwa. So, the reason why F 1 is very low for a high front vowel like E is because of the complicated relationship between Helmholtz resonances and the tube resonances. And a relation between F 1 and vowel height, F 1 decreases with the height of the vowel and as we can see because of Helmholtz resonator, the E has always a very high F1, then uh, the schwa which is the vocal tract is responsible for the F1 of the uh, schwa and the back cavity is responsible for the higher F1 for the vowel A. So, now when we talk about uh, the high back rounded vowel U, so the articulatory shape can be approximated with four tubes. So, we have the lips, the front cavity, the constriction and the back cavity. So, the additional property of the lips is relevant here because U is a rounded vowel. And so, we have the front cavity, the constriction and the back cavity. Now, for F 1 like E uh, which produces a very low F 1 like 300 hertz because of Helmholtz resonance and F 2 around 900 hertz the resonance of the front cavity and if we talk about U then comparatively now we have to take into account the lips again which is another tube because the lips give additional shape to a vowel like U. So, again for a vowel like U uh, recall that we have the lips as additional uh, tubes. So, we have the oral cavity with the pharynx with the glottis. So, we have all these tubes responsible for the production of the British English O. 
and this is uh, something that we would use for the production of British English R. So, uh, notice that there is a difference in the x-rays that you see alongside the tubes for the production of these vowels. So, we have R, so when the jaw goes down and we have the back cavity there and unlike this one where E, so there is a striking difference between the E and the R where the back cavity is more prominent. And the relation between F2 and vowel backness, F2 decreases with the backness of the vowel. And these are the F2 values of the three vowels here E, R uh, and U. And so we have 1900 hertz, we have 1500 hertz as we already know and U at 900 hertz. So now we note that U has a much lower F2. And now it is important to note that we, and we have already noted that this in all the other previous lectures that the F2, the form and frequency, the second form and frequency decreases with the backness of the vowel. So, here this is the, for the production of the, of the vowel U, the F2 decreases the backness of the vowel because it is the first resonance of the front cavity. And for E, it is the first resonance of the back cavity and for this, for, for the vocal tract and for Shoshua, this is the second resonance of the vocal tract, supraglottal. So, um, acoustic effect of lip rounding, lip rounding lowers formants. Note that the features plus back and plus round have effects on F2 both lower the second formant. So, phonologically again when we look at phonology we will again see that plus back plus round vowels are favored over minus back vowels which are not back but round and plus back and minus round vowels and also back vowels which are not rounded. So, basically the features back and round go together and the feature front and unrounded go together. And that is related to again the behavior of the tubes where one augments the other. So, the formants of vowels produced with constrictions can be modeled with several coupled tubes as we already know. And formants F1 and F2 have the primary effect on vowel perception and have systematic relations with features high and back which we will study in phonology. But something that we uh, will again uh, emphasize here again is that higher vowels have lower F1 and backer vowels have lower F2 because of the different cavities front and back cavity. And uh, high vowels have low F1 because high vowels such as E and U are articulated with a fairly narrow constriction and the air within the constriction tubes forms a Helmholtz resonator with the back cavity. In front vowels such as E, the second formant is the first resonance of the back cavity and that is the tube behind the tongue body. So, that results in the second formant and it is the first resonance of the back cavity which we had seen earlier. And this tube is closed at both ends. So, we know the formula for the tube closed at both ends and in a back vowel such as U, the second formant is the first resonance of the front cavity. So, this is altered for U, it is the first resonance uh, F2 is the first resonance of the front cavity that is uh, the tube forward of before the tongue and again for a vowel like E F2 is the so for a vowel like E F2 is the first resonance of the front cavity for a vowel like U F2 is the first resonance first resonance of the front cavity. We are doing this again just to see that the two cavities are different for the two vowels. For U, it is the first resonance of the front cavity. For E, it is the first resonance of the back cavity. So, the two are altered. For, for U, which is a back vowel, F2 is the resonance of the front cavity. For E, which is a front vowel, F2 is the first resonance of the back cavity. So, those are 
those things are altered. And we are again repeating the different um, formulas which are used for the different tubes. So, a tube closed at one end, this is the formula for a tube closed or a string fixed at both ends, this is the formula and for the Helmholtz resonators, this is the formula. And again high vowels such as E and U are articulated with a fair and narrow constriction which we just saw and the air within the constriction tube forms a Helmholtz resonator with the back cavity giving a resonance of where we have this formula which we will not go into because um, it will involve some explanation. It is just enough to know that there is a Helmholtz resonator which is responsible for the low frequencies of the high vowels. The Helmholtz resonance is the lowest resonance of the entire system, it is the F1. And again we know uh, that this is the value of speed of air, so 350 minutes per second and so you, we have the values for the vowel E, so this is the length of the different tubes and these lengths are uh, calculated based on the length of the tubes and then if we take into account all of these different lengths and which we see in this formula and we put them in the formula then we get a predicted F1 for E at 200 hertz. And similarly uh, for the F2 of back resonance of E, so the general equation for the resonance of tube closed at both ends, so this is the formula and then the length of the back cavity for the vowel E, so these are from Lady Foget, so we can see that this is the the point um, it is 11 cm is point um, 11 meters and then this is a predicted F1 is 1600 hertz using this formula. So, that is how we get the different uh, formants. So, this with the formula for the Helmholtz resonator we get 280 hertz for the predicted F2 for which as you recall we use the back cavity and then if we use the length of the back cavity and put it in in L and remember that the back cavity is closed at both ends and so that is why this formula will be used and that is why we will get this F2. And F2 back cavity and back cavity resonance of U. So, again general equation for of the resonance of the tube closed at only one end where remember recall that this is a formula we used for uh, the calculation of a Schwa, the resonances of Schwa. So, if we use it again for the calculation of F2 of U, then it is 900 hertz. So, lip rounding again recall lip rounding generally decreases performance and lip rounding lowers F2 by 100 hertz to around 800 hertz. So, uh, we are coming to the end of this uh, uh, part on the formant calculation using tube models. The formants of vowels produced with constrictions can be modeled with several tubes and formants F1 and F2 have the effect on vowel perception and have systematic relations with, with what we call high and back in the phonology. Higher vowels have lower F1 and backer vowels have lower F2. So, this is the a summary of this lecture that higher vowels, why higher vowels have lower F1 and why backer vowels have lower F2 can be predicted with the help of the tube models. Thank you for listening and this brings us to the end of our lecture on formants. Thank you.